is this actually what I want to be doing? Like, mm-hmm. is this the challenge that it's stressing me out so much? Is this really what I want to be doing with my life? But then you have days where you're tinkering with the product and working through these challenges that are so complex. And when you finally start to connect some of the dots, it's so fun that, you know, you're like, oh yeah, this is, this is cool. I love doing this. Welcome to Product Side Stories, the podcast where we reveal the very real and raw lessons learned from product leaders and thinkers all over the world. I'm your host, Rena Lexen, CEO of Product Side. Let's dive into today's episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Product Side Stories. My name is Rena Lexen. I'm the CEO of Product Side and your host today. I have joining me Parks Daniel. Uh, Parks and I have met when she was managing the learning and development organization at MasterCard. And now she is the director of product management at Dynamic Yield by MasterCard, a recent acquisition. Uh, Parks, thanks, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Rena. It's really good to be here. Um, yeah, I I first got to know product side through my role within learning and development when I was focused on the area of product management. And now it's really exciting to talk to you now that I've moved over into product and I'm using what I learned while I worked with this team on the job. Yeah. Well, you definitely hopped over to the other fence. Why don't you tell us a quick intro of why you got into product management? Why did you make the the move and, and crossed over? Yeah, well. I came to product management um, the same way most people do, which is, I don't know how I got here. I came to MasterCard um, coming out of business school. So I came through an MBA program in the United States. I had the option of joining the finance organization, an account management team, or product, just product high level in general. Those were the three options. And I knew account management wasn't for me. I had done that in my previous role, my previous life. Um, Finance was definitely not for me. I could get a feel for that in business school. Um, So product seemed like the right way to go. Um, And when I got to MasterCard, when I landed in a product role, kind of realized I didn't really know what it meant, didn't really know what it was, um, which is how I ended up in learning and development. The idea being that we wanted to define what good product management looked like for our PMs throughout the company. And, you know, selfishly, I wanted to learn what good product management looked like and start to apply it not only within L&D, but then maybe look towards becoming a, you know, fully fledged product manager once I left that team. Um, So that's how I landed here. Very circuitously, it was the option out there and it seemed like the best option for me. So what would you say now that you've experienced the role itself, how, how different or similar it is, is it from what you expected? It's kind of everything that I expected and everything that I didn't. Um, and I say that because there are things that you just know about product management. You have to understand the customer. You're responsible for gathering requirements. You're responsible for translating those requirements working with engineers, working with business stakeholders. Um, These are all things that I know in theory, but the reality on the ground is very different. Um, And I think the biggest surprise for me has been just how many ideas are always coming at you that you then have to vet, prioritize, really understand the value behind. Um, That is kind of been the biggest surprise to date in terms of what I expected and what I didn't. And I came into this role with a really good background in product management. So I've worked really closely with product side to build learning opportunities, learning experiences that align to these key skills that product managers are responsible for. Um, I've worked with people on your team to write the curriculum back to front to test it with audiences throughout MasterCard. Um, but now that I'm in the role, so we, we developed two classes, two classes that I think are fundamental to product management, customer understanding and awareness, know your customers, and then uh, prioritization. So understanding how to prioritize, getting very tactical with those methods. 
I know all of this back to front. I know these are critical skills, but my God, stepping into this role, I have lost the plot. Like everything is coming at me. There are so many different opportunities that we could chase on this team and every different stakeholder has a different need or a different want. So I found it very challenging to actually take what I know is you know, the basic foundation of this role into the role itself and be a little more methodical and smart about the way that I prioritize things and approach what I'm doing. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty funny, you know, how something looks on the outside is not how it feels once you're in it. Well, you know, I've heard a lot of product managers describe that they often have to change their lens uh, when when they're dealing with a lot of incoming requests from stakeholders and managing so many different things, their aperture has to increase. And then when they focus on the execution, it decreases to focus. Have you tried any of these kinds of methods or frameworks that have really helped you in prioritizing all of those requests coming at you? So... I think the first part of that question is actually about the customer understanding piece. Mm -hmm. And I, I attended a really good webinar that we had within MasterCard maybe last week or, or two weeks ago that reminded me that empathy mapping is so important, no matter who your audience is. Um, and so that to me was kind of the first step of prioritization before you get into understanding what the options are and what what is better or worse for this reason or that reason just setting out the basics of who is my audience internal external engineer business leader i hadn't set that foundation yet within this role and i really needed to do that um so simple tools like empathy mapping i think are really important um and then when it comes to prioritization i think we are very simply looking at value versus effort uh -huh. at this point. Um, some of my products are a little bit more in the um, ether. I, you know, they're not, it's hard to get really uh, specific about them because I have a lot of white space. So I work at Dynamic Yield by MasterCard, which is a company that has innovate, been innovative in uh, personalization for customers in the retail space. But my challenge is taking that to the financial space. So how do we personalize for FIs, banks, those kinds of customers? Um, can you, one sec, uh, because you said FIs, can you say what that stands for? Financial? Yeah, so FIs, yeah. So trying to uh, personalize for financial institutions. So banks are among those. Um, and it's a really challenging space. It's a space that doesn't have a lot to go off of. So it's white space, new concepts. Um, you know, when we think about the cost to build something, a lot of the cost right now is the time it takes to adapt what we've previously built for this customer or for this specific use case. Um, so value versus effort is probably what I use most often at this point. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of magic in two by twos as, as, as we know. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I want to take you because, uh, as as you know, this series we like to discuss with new new product leaders uh, what their first ninety days look like. And now that you're past your first ninety days, it's often a really good time to reflect not just what happened, but how you could make it better. So, can you walk me through what you did in your first ninety days that I think set you that you think set yourself up for success? Yeah, well, the first thirty days I was definitely like a deer in headlights. Uh, people were throwing a lot at me. Um, I'm in a really interesting situation where my manager was going on maternity leave within like three to four months. So it was, let's give you everything that you could possibly need when I go out so you can run while I'm gone. Um, so the, for the first month I had her ask, telling me, ask questions, ask questions. And I was thinking, I don't even know what this product is yet. I don't know how anything works. I don't know what questions to ask. Um, and I think I definitely put a lot of pressure on myself to come up with the right questions to contribute to the work. Um, but really there was not much I could do. I just didn't understand the product well enough. It takes a lot of time, a lot of uh, conversations with different product owners around this company 
using the product, starting to get into what the product actually does, and then working with customers to really understand what the context is, what this product is and what the context is and what the value is. Um, so I think those first two months, I was trying to grasp onto something, but then had no idea what to grasp onto. Mm -hmm. um, so by floundering a little bit, for sure. By month three and four, that's kind of when things started to turn and that I'm starting to understand what the product actually is. I'm starting to ask the right questions. And now it's just, can I keep this product going well enough while my manager goes out on maternity leave and I start to take on more responsibility and own what this product actually does? Um, so those were kind of the first 30 days, really stepping into a product role. I think, you know, don't forget, I came from learning and development. So there were two layers of challenge for me to get through. One, learning to product management. I might have practiced product management in my old team, but it is very different. Owning a learning and development product that is internally focused, very different from owning a product that is out in the market, that we are trying to derive revenue from, that there are live customers for. Um, it's a lot of pressure. And then on top of that, just getting to know a whole new product, uh, a whole new function. Um, so product management with a new team, it, it was just intense those first 90 days. Um, and I think that, you know, that's been a big lesson for me is there's a lot of imposter syndrome that comes with that. Mm -hmm. So how do you kind of let that go and not put the pressure on yourself, use the people around you, not put so much pressure on, uh, not take everything so personally. I think that's, that's what I've been really been learning in the first three to four months. Can you share um, an example of that? Because I, I want to be honest with you. I yeah. think everybody at one point in their career, unless they're, I, I don't know who, uh, has some level of imposter syndrome. Uh, and I think that has to do with more of, especially with product management, you have to live in a space where you're being tasked to figure out a lot of answers where you may never have had that experience before. So I think it's only natural to feel like, hey, am I the one that should be making all of these decisions? So maybe let's yes. let's talk about like, where did those, where did you feel that most? And then talk about strategies of like, how do you leverage those feelings to actually make you very productive? Because that's how I like to think about it. No, I think that's a great way to think about it because I've been trying to do the same thing. I think what you just said is where that imposter syndrome comes up the most. It's realizing that you are the one who is the backstop for this product. You're the one who's making the decisions. There is nobody else that comes after you. It, you know, you, you could have a big, great team around you, but you're the owner of these ideas and whatever is going to happen with this product. Um, I am just thinking about the fact that I went on, I went on vacation maybe three weeks ago. I went on a ski vacation. It didn't even take a full week off. I just took a long weekend. And as I am on the ski slopes for like my first run, I get a ping. Did you know that your product is broken? Oh, and no. my product had broken in like five different ways, three different teams that I needed help from to fix it. Um, fortunately, I had a great team and great help back in the office to make things work. But wow, the pressure was so intense. And I just, I was on this ski slope just thinking, wow, I don't know if I'm having fun right now. I am worried about my product as I am skiing in France. This is not where I wanna be in my life. Um, and you know, there are moments like that where you think, is this actually what I wanna be doing? Like, is this the challenge that it's stressing me out so much, is this, really what I want to be doing with my life. But then you have days where you're tinkering with these, with the products and working through these challenges that are so complex. And when you finally start to connect some of the dots, it's so fun that, you know, you're like, oh yeah, this is, this is cool. I love doing this. What's um, an example of like a fun moment? Can you tell maybe a story about something that really worked with your team? I, I think, again, like it comes back to what you said about getting, uh, not never having enough information and just having to put mm -hmm. ideas out there. Um, I've put together a product concept in the last few weeks with my team. And what I've really enjoyed is, are those moments where we realize the simple answer is the right answer. 
because I think so often we try to make things harder than they need to be. And then also when you share them with the team, they come back and say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Let's move forward. Um, so I don't know if I have a really good specific example of those moments. I think it's just those like conversations that happen on a Friday afternoon when everybody's ready to leave and all of a sudden you're jamming out for an hour and a half on this concept that you think, wow, this might actually work if we build it this way. Let's mm -hmm. validate this. Um, those have just happened a few times over the last few months that have really made me excited about it, this role. Yeah. Well, going back to just the, the feelings, and by the way, we've all also had, I don't, I don't know about skiing in France, I, I would love to be there, but had those moments of you think everything's okay, and then there's just a shock to the system where you feel totally, totally. responsible for it. And I think responsibility and ownership are key to a great product manager uh, at any stage of their career. And there's just, there is a lot of responsibility because you are responsible for the work that goes in for all of your stakeholders. You are responsible for the outcomes for the business, for what your customers experience. So how do you manage, I guess, the since now that you're thrown into more of a commercial customer facing product, how do you think about that responsibility um, in a way that, you know, it's not just affecting you from a stress perspective, but also like really owning it and owning the outcomes that you're able to produce? Totally. Every, you know, that experience when I was on vacation was a really good lesson for me in how to prepare. Um, and I know, in you know, one of the rules in product management that I, I know is true, you can never predict what is going to break. And how it's going to break, but you can prepare yourself as much as possible. Um, make sure you understand the gaps in your product. Make sure you have an answer for that. Make sure you understand how customers are going to use your product, so you can anticipate mm -hmm. where you know the the gaps might happen, where the breaks might happen. Um, so I think that has been really important, a really important lesson. Um, and then trying to productize pieces of that or put process in place so that when the breaks do happen, we have a quick, we have channels to fix it quickly and that everybody is aware of what their role is, what their responsibility is. So my product, I am working with MasterCard customers, trying to bring dynamic yield personalization to MasterCard's financial institution customers. I have a lot of channels to go through to get to them because we have account people who are working with them on a day-to-day -day basis. By the time, you know, a break comes back to the product team, it's already been through two to three people before we finally learn about what's happening and get an idea of what's happening with, with the issue. So part of my responsibility is making sure that the communication is cl as clear as possible and as quick and early, it happens as early as possible along that line um, of communication. So. That I think has been a really good lesson for me um, and how, how we approach that moving forward. And the accountability and the responsibility is really fun. I think, you know, they say you go through these challenges, you go through these tense points because it, it's gonna help you become a better person, a better product manager, a better, le better leader. So yes, there is definitely a lot of stress involved, but I spend a lot of time thinking, just gotta get through this. We'll make it to the end next week and do it better that time. Yeah. So how has that, how, how have these experiences actually colored with uh, what you want to focus on in the next three months uh, at uh, Dynamic Yield? Yeah. So I I'm, think sorry, that Dynamic I, Yield by MasterCard, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that I've spent the first, and I guess I'm about four or five months into the role now, I've spent the first four to five months getting a grasp on the product, making sure that I understand how it works, um, making sure I know how to fix it when it doesn't work. And now I want to start thinking about where do we go next with this product? How do we grow it? Um, there are a couple of different products I'm working on. So same thing on both of these sides. They're at, they're at different places in their life cycle. Um, but what is the strategy? What is the vision? And what are the pieces that I need to find and validate to get us there? Um, so yeah, really thinking about the roadmap, essentially, mm -hmm. and 
beginning to understand our customers more. I think one thing that people who work in a B2B to C space can probably, and big corporations can probably um, empathize with is that it can be really challenging to get to our customers within the financial space. We've got a lot of products. Everybody wants to talk to a customer. How do we make that work in a way that doesn't overwhelm our customers is kind of the challenge. Um, and for me over the next few months, I want to figure out how to take that challenge and get around it a little bit, start to build the roadmap and then start to validate our ideas. I also want to bring some, not sophistication, that's not the, the right word, but bring a little bit more process to the way that we work together. It's so, bigger. you know, yeah, we've, we've talked about, you and I talked about stakeholder challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the best ways we can manage our stakeholders is by understanding their needs across the board. Um, and we can put process in place to do that so that we're not caught out, we're not surprised, um, we, we have the answers that we need ahead of time. So that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking about. How can we better serve our internal customers as well as our external customers? So let me, let me talk to you about that because I, I have a lot of thoughts on stakeholder management, especially given what you are describing, you are, you know, a new member of a team where you have a product where there is a solution for a known persona and you're actually building that kind of similar type of solution for a new persona for that business. And so you are, I think, having the challenge of you still have the existing, are you still working on the existing product for retail or no? Not really. No, okay. I'm, I'm pretty separate from that. So instead I'm just you know, knocking on the PMs who do own that product, their door saying, uh, can you please fix this for me? It's not working quite right for my FI customers in this case. Which is, I see. So I you're managing people. other, so there's an additional layer of, I guess, stakeholders, but the people that you're interfacing with, like the sales team, for example, they, they uh, work with both the retail and the financial consumers. To some extent. I mean, there yeah. is definitely a little bit of separation. So MasterCard acquired Dynamic Yield and Dynamic Yield had a well-oiled machine when it comes to sales. They've got a great sales team that is focused on that retail base who has started to talk to FI customers as well. Um, but we also leverage our relationships with MasterCard. Um, you know, MasterCard is great with customer management as well. So we have we're coming at it from both sides a little bit. Yeah, I'm more thinking in the sense of when you, uh, you know, you have all these different stakeholders and there's a lot coming at you, as you as you were mentioning at the start of our conversation, uh, it's more in the sense of, uh, I think it's linked to the same challenge that you're talking about with customer understanding. For you to go and manage all the st stakeholders' expectations, you need to come rooted with an opinion on, on the vision, right, for your product. What is that roadmap? And then they need to be seen they need to see that they are heard, actually. So they need yeah. to feel heard, uh, that all of the requests that they are making of you are, are understood and that the decisions that you are making, that they have trust in your decisions because you have all of this context. You don't have just their context. Usually yeah. with stakeholders, they have a very specific context where they are making certain assumptions around how their users or customers are using the product. They think, you know, because because I'm just going to give an example, a salesperson talks to a prospect and feels like, okay, I could have sold this had we had this one feature. It's one sliver. So they're lacking all of the context that you have. Uh, and, but that means that there is a misalignment of information, right? So you have, you are supposed to have more information and that makes you more qualified to make certain decisions about the long-term roadmap of the product. But that's the, that's the conflict, right? With stakeholders of they think they have all the information and they want to see their information visible yeah. in your plan. Yeah, definitely. They, stakeholders want to see all of everything that they've talked about in the plan. A lot of them assume that it's already happening before you've ever committed to anything, which is pretty funny to me. Um, I also just think people are, one of the other challenges that I deal with is that People have very different working styles. So depending on what background you come from, you might be a little bit more relaxed 
you might be a little bit more of a go-getter, get really aggressive in there and make very demanding, have very challenging demands of the product team that we're not ready to meet, we're not comfortable to meet. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you, how do you, push back on those very important stakeholders who are managing very important customer relationships without pissing them off, without yeah. burning the bridge. Um, I think that I've probably come close to burning a few bridges, just putting up my boundaries. You know, I'm, I've always had strong boundaries at work. Don't come for my product in a way that we can't meet your expectation, but you kind of have to let that go to some point and be a little softer, be a little bit more diplomatic. Um, try to try to find the happy medium where you're not really giving them what they want necessarily right now, but you make them feel good about where you're going and that it's in line with what they're expecting. Do you have a communication strategy with your stakeholders of, okay, I, I, from what I'm hearing from you, you're still kind of building out what the roadmap should look like, but then have essentially a communication strategy of like, here are, here's the reasons why we're making these kinds of decisions. And here's what you can expect from the product team over the next, maybe like, maybe it's just the now uh, section yeah. of the roadmap. I think dynamic yield, our, our product team in general has a pretty good approach to this, um, the way that we communicate. I think I'm figuring out where do I slot in with that and what is both my personal communication style, because I think we do a good job as a company of communicating with our stakeholders. So we have a pretty nice roadmap that the team puts together and will share internally with sales teams, with our customer delivery teams, before then we share it with our external customers to get feedback um, and, and not necessarily to get feedback, but to show them, like you said, we've, we've listened to what they've been saying. Um, and we try to be as explicit and as specific as possible in that roadmap, tailoring it to the audience, depending on who it is we're speaking to, which I think is really important. Um, and that's kind of the approach. I, it's a simple approach. We have a roadmap, we put it to paper and we tailor it to the right audience, but I think it's very effective and just bringing customers along on the ride whether it's external or internal customers, I think they feel like they're a part of this. And if you give mm -hmm. them the room in the presentation to respond, then they really feel like they're a part of this. Um, especially if then, you know, one of the things we will typically do is put some data behind it. Say, you know, X percent of you have been asking for this feature. We know you're really excited about it. Um, so we're really excited to bring this to market or, Market trends tell us like this is where we need to be, and we know that it's a priority for you. So this is what we're working on. Um, I think that has been really effective. So, so I hear you saying. So it sounds like early communication, probably some kind of level of frequency that people are expect information, and, and yeah, you, yeah. And then uh, what I'm also hearing is just uh, data is so important. So I'm glad you brought that up. So yeah. then, how did you, or what did you do? where you were communicating with stakeholders, where it could have, could, uh, could have resulted in a burnt bridge situation. Yeah, I think, as I mentioned, I'm working on a new part of the business. And so those expectations that live within Dynamic Yield as a company today, don't necessarily live with everybody else. Mm. So we have to set those expectations. And again, I think some of the, there's a challenge with working you know, for a large company like MasterCard and then an acquisition coming in, we have different, very different ways of working. And so one team expects to work this way, another team expects to work another way. Um, so how do you kind of bridge that gap? MasterCard teams definitely want to deliver something for their clients tomorrow. Mm -hmm. they, we want to turn things around as quickly as possible. We want to give them a response as quickly as possible. Our product teams on the other side are used to working with SLAs. So, you know, mm. give us two days to figure this out. Give us a week to figure this out. It's, it's not like we're taking our time, but we're not quite as immediate and reactive. We're a little more, um, we're a little more cautious in the way that we respond. We want to make sure we have a full answer or understanding of the problem before we go back to the customer. So I think those two different ways of working um, really come into conflict. 
And also the idea of, you know, DY works with uh, in two week sprints and I want to respect those while also making sure that we're delivering for the customers as we need to, we're launching the product as we need to. Um, yeah, but not. Yeah, that's anything. a really good point, especially with uh, when it comes with acquisitions, you're dealing with multiple cultures and that's what you're basically yeah. talking about is um, at some, I mean, ideally, right. You do delivery continuously. Uh, and however, if you are working with an organization where that's not what they're used to, you're not going to be able to switch them overnight. And so, oh, especially yeah. with the, you coming in as a new person, really important to establish trust and respect for their way of working. And then over time, I, I, I would, I would expect that the expectations change. I mean, there's time. Time is useful like that. So you can model different kinds of behavior, establish more new expectations. Uh, but I, I can see the challenge of like, hey, this is also two cultures merging. It's not just two teams. Totally. And what does product own versus what does account management own? What does customer delivery own? Um, those definitions are really different as you go through even just different parts of MasterCard, much less working with an acquisition versus MasterCard. Mm -hmm. Um, so defining what product owns and, you know, where product gets to have the final ish say on things, uh, I say final ish because, you know, the final say always, A, there's never a final say, the product is always evolving and B, that final say really comes from customer data and feedback and that kind of thing. Um, but kind of defining who owns what and why, um, I think that's been one of our biggest challenges, but it's a fun challenge to solve. It's something that we're just, you know, we're putting a product out, we're building it on the fly, we're building it as we go. And so we're still learning how this way, what this way of working should actually look like when we're working together. So one benefit of, of what you were saying is that these kinds of how we work together, although yes, to stay organized and to be able to deliver, you, you need a good understanding of roles and responsibilities, but clarifying those over time, the like Bracey's, Daisy's, whatever you use, those are supposed to be living documents and a start of a conversation. So that's also the benefit of someone new coming in is you get to you know, you get to ask a lot of these kinds of questions around what are the expectations between our teams? And then you could see if they work or if they could be amended. Yeah. And that's one thing I will say that's really fun working. I've always found this working at MasterCard. I've certainly found this at DY is that everybody is open to feedback and everybody is willing to give feedback, which is good. I mean, sometimes can be a little aggressive, but you know, aggressive is the wrong word there just a little jarring to get some very immediate feedback but people want to tell you what's working about the product and what's not and feedback is a gift but so i found that our teams are all very open to talking about how we're working which is really good because i think i think we need to be open to making mistakes with each other and then finding a better way to move forward is something as simple as setting up the right teams chat for the right customer audience group. Um, little things like that, that just help us work a little bit better, um, have been, have been really good for, uh, yeah. all of these different relationships, all these different stakeholders I'm working with. Well, what you're describing to me where there is direct, honest feedback, so valuable. Uh, and it, it means it's an, it's a culture with a lot of psychological safety, which is yeah. you're willing to take the risk of saying something that someone might receive in a more, I don't like saying negative, but you know, there's this negative connotation sometimes with feedback, even though from my perspective, not saying something doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? Not calling things out, calling things out, even though it can be sometimes brave, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. So Parks, uh, now that you've experienced the role, you've been on the learning and development side, now you switched over to product. What advice do you have for somebody who's looking to get into a product role, be it a new product role or a leadership role? Yeah. So I think the number one thing to do that I think about when it comes to transitioning to a product role is networking. Networking is true no matter what role you're in, but you will never know what opportunities are out there if you don't talk to people. And so talking to different product people, 
uh, within your organization or outside of your organization, to me, that is step one to getting this job. And I, I networked for quite a while before I found this role. And the one thing I always asked people was, are you looking to hire in the next few months? Very directly, are you looking to hire? And B, are there two to three people you might connect me with who you know are looking to expand their teams? So I'm always really asking what the opportunity is, if there are any, and who else I can talk to to explore other opportunities. So I think that's really important. Ask. Ask what's out there. I love that that is really good advice. And I also really like the idea of asking not just the person, but like, who else can I talk to? That's, that's really smart. So, uh, Parks, how can people find you after this podcast? Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Parks Daniel, working at MasterCard. Um, I'm also on Instagram, but you're going to find a lot of my yoga content there, less of my product content. Although I do give a shout to product on Instagram. Man, I have to then check out your Instagram. I'm interested. What was it that you were doing? Like a handstand? Uh, Pincha. That's not on there. I'm not ready to show the world about <laughs> Pincha. That's, that's for my home practice one day. I, I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was a great discussion. Cool. Thank you, Rena. It's really nice to be here. Um, really enjoyed it. Awesome. And thank you all for tuning into another episode of Product Side Stories. I hope today's insights propel you forward and that you remember every challenge is just another lesson waiting to be learned. Visit us at productside.com for more free resources, including webinars, templates, playbooks, and other product wisdom repackaged for you. My name is Rena Lexen, and until next time, keep innovating, keep leading, and keep creating stories worth sharing.